Good afternoon. This is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece on September 28th, 2024. On September 13th, the Biden administration issued a statement alleging that RT, Russia's state-owned broadcaster, is essentially an arm of Russia's intelligence services. The administration claimed that its allegations were based in part on information provided by RT employees, but it didn't name any of them, nor did it provide any objective, credible evidence to back up the allegation. That did not prevent other Western governments from embracing the claims immediately. For example, within hours of the U.S. government making the allegation, Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie leveled the same allegation against RT, but she too provided zero evidence to back up her claim. What, in fact, does the available evidence show about allegations that Russia's government covertly interferes in the politics of Western states? Now here to unpack this with me is John Kiriakou. John is a former analyst and case officer for the CIA. He was, first, he was the first U.S. government official to confirm that waterboarding was used to interrogate al-Qaeda prisoners, which he described rightly as torture. In 2012, he became the only CIA officer to be convicted for exposing the CIA's torture program. He was sentenced shamefully to 30 months in prison. He's now an author and a journalist and is a founding member of the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome him to Reason to Resist today. Thank you for coming on the show, John. Thanks for the inv invitation, Dimitri. It's a pleasure. So, John, before we turn to the uh, U.S. government's latest allegations about Russian interference, and RT, I'd like to talk to you about some claims made before this most recent set of allegations from the Biden administration by Canada's parliament and specifically the National Security and Intelligence Committee of the parliament. And in June of this year, that committee released a heavily redacted report on alleged foreign interference in Canada. As I explained in a recent op-ed, the report was almost completely devoid of any real evidence. It largely relied upon unsubstantiated claims made by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, notwithstanding repeated findings by Canadian courts that CSIS misrepresents the facts to judges in this country. And in a recent decision, the finding was that the failures to tell the truth were systemic. That's the word that the court used. So John, one of the passages in that report that stood out for me, it concerned alleged Russian interference in US elections, even though the report was supposed to be out Canada, and here's what the report claimed on page 35, quote, Canada's strategic response to foreign interference in democratic processes and institutions must be understood in the context that brought the issue to the fore. So I just want to pause there, John, and point out that what the committee is telling us at this part of its report is that they're about to identify the thing that started the whole controversy around alleged Russian right. interference. They go on and they say, as noted earlier, Russia carried out an influence campaign aimed at the United States in the 2016 presidential election with the goal of undermining public faith in the U.S. democratic process and discrediting the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. It did so by leveraging social media to provoke and amplify political and social discord in the U.S. This influence effort was complemented by targeted cyber hacks and the release of materials damaging to the Clinton campaign. The U.S. intelligence community was aware of Russian efforts during the presidential campaign, but the central challenge for the U.S. government during those events was how to inform the American public of Russia's interference without appearing to unduly influence the course of the election. Russia would go on to employ similar hack and leak and disinformation campaigns in the U.K., France, and Germany. So, John, in a September 17, 2024 op-ed in Consortium News, you talked about the allegation that Russia interfered in the 2016 U.S. election. Could you summarize for us your view? Actually, please be as detailed as you'd like to be, because I think it's a... <laughs> so. Well, uh, what's, what's this, your allegation? Th this isn't just John talking, right? This is this is the result of an exhaustive FBI uh, investigation into these allegations. And the FBI found in the Mueller report, which everybody is perfectly free to read online for free, uh, that there was no uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election. Now, the, the government keeps repeating that there was, as well as in the 2020 election and now in the upcoming 2024 election. But the government position is, take our word for it. We can't tell you the details because they're classified. But, oh boy, if you could see what we see, you would know. Well, listen, I've been there. I lived there. It's just a lie. Right. So in the 2016 election, they're talking about two things. 
One, they're talking about Julian Assange and the DNC uh, email uh, uh, tranche that ended up being published by WikiLeaks. Bill Binney, who was the technical director at NSA, the, the fourth ranking official in NSA and arguably one of our country's leading technical thinkers has said on the record that the Russians were not involved in the DNC uh, email hack. And the reason he knows that is that he's analyzed the speed with which the documents were uploaded. And he said that it is impossible to upload documents remotely using that speed. That the only way those documents could have been taken was in person, downloaded on a thumb drive. Okay, with that in mind, Ambassador Craig Murray is the former British ambassador to Uzbekistan. He's a torture whistleblower who was thrown out of the, the British Foreign Service because he blew the whistle on torture in Uzbekistan. He came to the United States in 2016 to present me with an award. That was actually a cover trip. He was actually in the United States on behalf of WikiLeaks to meet with the whistleblower and to take possession of the thumb drive, which he then flew back to Iceland and gave to WikiLeaks. So this notion that the KGB or whatever the KGB calls itself today, remotely, <clears throat> excuse me, remotely hacked the DNC, stole emails from John Podesta and others to embarrass Hillary Clinton. It's just simply not true. It's factually incorrect. That's number one. Before you, if you're, are you, are you about to leave the question of the hack? Because I want to ask you a question about that. Oh, sure. Please go right ahead. Okay. So my understanding is that those emails, first of all, I think we can say safely that they weren't disinformation. They reveal no. valuable information. No, they, they, they were primary source right. emails. Correct. They're authentic. They really are. The yes. So, and, and one of the things they showed, as I recall, is that uh, basically Hillary Clinton and the DNC were cheating. <laughs> and, you know, Bernie yeah. Sanders because they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's an important point. Right. That's an important point. And so it, somebody it in the DNC who was sympathetic to Sanders would have had a motive to yes. reveal it to the public. So is, yeah, Correct. is all of that fair? Yeah. OK, sorry. That please. is one that is 100 percent accurate. That's 100 percent. And it's far more believable that somebody at the DNC said, hey, wait a minute, how can Bernie Sanders win 60% in the Wyoming and West Virginia caucuses and win zero delegates, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hillary Clinton gets 40% in both of those races and wins literally every single delegate. That's more believable than some remote Russian hack that we don't fully understand. Right, right. Okay, so please, you were gonna talk about the next part. Yeah, I was gonna make a, make a second point. Yeah. The second point was, and this is straight from the uh, from the Mueller report, the Russians spent $50,000 on Facebook ads uh, in the run-up to the 2016 election. Now, when you say Russians, are you talking about the government or somebody? No, and thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. No, it's, well, to, to hear the U.S. government say it is, it is a, an organization with ties to the Kremlin what the heck does that mean? Either it's a governmental organization or it's not. Either it's an intelligence organization or it's not. Right. But, you know, I've met Joe Biden twice. Does that mean I have ties to the White House? No. Of depends course. on your agenda, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It depends on your agenda. Right. So they spent $50,000 on Facebook ads in the run up to the 2016 election. Half of that money, $25,000, was spent after the election was over. OK, so it, it played no role in anything. Right. The other twenty five thousand dollars was spent in states that were either completely red or completely blue. And what were these ads? They were mostly cat emojis, right, or jokes. So maybe the Russians were just testing it to see can we do this? How hard is it? Can we establish these relationships that will allow us to, to buy ads? Who knows? To the question, did, 
did the Russians influence the 2016 election? The answer is a resounding no, they did not. The truth of the matter is that Hillary Clinton was probably the only Democrat in America who couldn't beat Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find anybody else who's that bad. <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit. So, so let can we talk about the 2020 election? Because they're also, you know, you you address this in your piece in the consortium in the consortium news, which I thought was quite interesting. What you had to say there. Well, think of it this way. Bill Clinton, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Joe Biden spent over a billion dollars on his election. Donald Trump spent over a billion dollars on his election. You have super PACs spending more billions of dollars. And then Mark Zuckerberg testified before uh, Congress that the Russians spent $100,000 on Facebook ads. And again, you know, we, we get to this point where you say, well, what were the ads? Uh, what, what were the accounts? He said they were Russians posing as Americans. Okay, show us. Oh, can't show you. It's classified. But if you could see what I see, you would know. No. When billions and billions of dollars are being spent on advertising, $100,000 worth of random ads not targeted at any specific voters in states that are already completely blue or completely red are not going to influence the election, period. You know, this is, this is more historical than we give it credit for being in that here in the United States, and I know that you've studied this kind of thing as well, we always need an ism to rally against. You know, it was, it was Bolshevism at the beginning of the 20th century. Then it was anarchism. Then it was socialism, right? Uh, Eugene V. Debs, oh my God, a socialist is running for president. Then it was communism or Nazism and then communism. And now it, it's this, we, we always have to have some kind of enemy that we can rally the American people against. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask why, why don't we just clean up our own act and improve our country? I Why does it have to be negative? I want to come to, back to that primordially, primordially important question. Why are they doing this? But before we get there, I want to uh, address the September 13th allegation, this most recent set of allegations. Yes. What do you understand uh, the allegations of against RT to be, those that were articulated by the State Department on September 13th? And what yeah. is your assessment of those particular allegations? Yeah, so the, the State Department is alleging that RT, Russia to, formerly known as Russia Today, which is the Russian international media outlet, um, is, uh, has been subordinated to Russian intelligence. Okay, it's just factually, it's ridiculous. Listen, if, if I was going to use the media to either conduct intelligence operations or to influence a foreign election or to collect intelligence information. I would use your media. I would put people at CNN and MSNBC and Fox, not in my own media organization. They're not gonna collect anything there, <laughs> especially after RT has been disbanded in the United States, disbanded in Canada, disbanded in the European Union. The only places you could watch it are, are China, India, Africa, and Latin America. That's it. But I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, I worked with a former CNN anchorman named uh, Rick Sanchez. And Rick got an odd call from a contact of his at the State Department before this all happened a couple of weeks before this all happened saying, hey man, what are you doing? What are you doing? Working for the Russians? Why are you doing that? Oh, it's a bad organization. It's a propaganda organization. But one of the things that this guy said, and I think he probably said it accidentally, was that RT is very, very popular in Africa and Latin America. And RT is presenting its side of the story in the Ukraine war. And it's beginning to change public opinion there. That's what the administration is objecting to. 
-hmm. they're losing international public opinion and people are less likely to support Ukraine now. Mm -hmm. So I think this whole nonsense about RT being an intelligence organization, it's just so silly and it's backward in its logic. Mm -hmm. I think we should ignore it. I think that the truth is that RT has been successful in changing some minds um, outside of that US, Canada, Australia, European Union nexus. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem for the State Department. Right. I think that's really what it is. Now, I, I'll add another thing, too. Um, I have a radio show at Sputnik Radio every day. I have for the last seven and a half years. When the Russians first approached me and offered me a radio show, I said no. I didn't really want to work for the Russians. And then they came back six months later and they said, listen, we, we have this radio show and we'd like for you to, to be the anchor. And I said, well, you know, the truth is I had always wanted to get into radio. So I said, if I was to work for you guys, I would want the freedom to say anything I want and to criticize anyone I want, including Vladimir Putin. They said, done. I said, yeah. Are you willing to put that in, in the contract? They said, done. And they did. And so in seven and a half years, I have never been asked to say something or to not say something. And on the morning of the, the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, I opened my show by saying, I unreservedly condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine and I call on Russian troops to withdraw immediately. Another thing is in Russia, in all the Russian media, they, they call the invasion of Ukraine the special military operation. I said, I'm not doing that. I'm calling it the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And nobody ever objected. Mm -hmm. So you know, somehow we're, we're a propaganda outlet. May, may I offer one more uh, anecdote? By all means. By all means. Every Thursday uh, on my show, I devote 30 minutes to criminal justice issues. And I call it criminal injustice. And I have two guests. One is a, a journalist who covers criminal justice issues. And the other is uh, the founder of a group called the Human Rights Defense Center, which publishes prison legal news and criminal legal news magazines. So we talk about crooked cops and crooked judges and crooked prosecutors and terrible prison conditions, we, all this stuff. One day, the Washington Post assigned a journalist to listen to the show. And they focused on the criminal injustice segment. And they wrote in the post the next day that John Kiriakou is weakening our democracy by talking about these issues. I'm weakening our democracy by saying, oh, a judge in Pennsylvania got arrested for taking a bribe to put children in prison, a bribe from a private prison company. Oh, uh, there was a... Uh, there was a prison in Mississippi that is so full of rats that even in the, in the big container of milk, they found a dead rat and the state shut it down. I'm the one who's weakening our democracy. It's not the corrupt system that we have. Right. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with this irrational anti-Russian uh, opinion, not just in government, but in the media here. And listen, I have no love of the Russians. I really don't. I don't like them any more than I like anybody else. I don't dislike them any more than I dislike anybody else. It's a job. But they've been good to me. They've never, ever, ever asked me to propagandize anybody, and I'm free to say anything I want. I must say for the record, John, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I appear fairly regularly on RT myself. I, I, I did not know that. I, That's I, great. I, I'm off, I've often been on Crosstalk. Uh, sometimes I come on live. They always ask me to talk about issues that matter to me, which are effectively foreign policy and particularly Western foreign policy, they have never imposed any constraint whatsoever on anything that I can say. And, uh, and, and one thing I wanted to talk to you about in particular, like uh, uh, you and I, I think might have had a similar sort of trajectory in terms of our interactions with the media. When I was um, doing the practice of law much more than journalism, I was uh, bringing large class actions against major Canadian corporations. And these tended to attract the attention of the financial press. Uh, you know, salacious, I mean, they were well-founded allegations of securities fraud and other forms of corporate manipulation against 
well-known corporate executives in this country. And so I was regularly uh, interviewed by the corporate media. And then in 2016, all of that changed. What happened then was I began to publicly criticize Canadian and American foreign policy and right. particularly Canada's support for Israel. And then I right. became Brian. So um, the, the reason why I, and I've, I've, I've tried to explain this to people who ask me why I go on RT. The reason why you see me nowadays is much more on RT than you do in the Canadian corporate media is because RT invites me on and they don't. It's as simple see, as that. Now, I, I say the same thing. I, I, you, I, you I used to be on CNN. Right, correct. Yeah, I, Go ahead, talk about that. I used to be on CNN and MSNBC with regularity. And they they dropped me inexplicably. Now, I go on Fox a lot, which is causes me no end of problems with my with my most of my friends because I consider myself to be very much a part of the left. But um, but Fox is the only organization that's willing to criticize the CIA. And so, of course, I'm going to go on and talk about intelligence issues. They're the only ones with the guts to talk about them. And, just and, like RT. And they've got a huge audience. And if they're not constraining what you can say, why the hell wouldn't you take the invitation? It makes no sense. Exactly. It's crazy. Exactly. And you know, I'm I'm proud I'm proud to be able to speak uh, my mind and speak freely with the Russians. I was invited to lunch with the Russian ambassador a year ago. Uh, he had read something that I had written in Consortium News and didn't even know that I was an employee of Sputnik. So he invited me to lunch. It was at the Russian embassy. And I go over there, fantastic lunch. And he wanted to talk about ways in which he could try to improve relations with the United States, even in a time of war. And I said, actually, I have three thoughts. Um, number one is counterterrorism, right? We should be in lockstep on terrorism issues. Number two is counterproliferation. None of us want rogue organizations to uh, end up with uh, nuclear or fissile material. And number three is um, counter narcotics. I said, I'll tell you the truth. When I was the chief investigator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I went to Afghanistan to do a study on heroin poppy production. And Afghanistan at the time was producing 93% of the world's heroin poppy. And when I came back, I wrote all this up. I interviewed people from DEA. I interviewed academics. I interviewed journalists and Afghan veterans. And the report ended up going nowhere. Why? Because the policy is that we, that all that heroin goes to Iran and Russia, and we want them to be addicted to heroin. It makes their societies weaker. So no, we're not gonna do anything to stop the heroin trade. Mm -hmm. But you raise, a vitally, like, you raise a vitally important point, which is that there are common interests between the American people and the Russian people. And I, I'd like to highlight two others that are I, of the utmost urgency. Both the American people and the Russian people and all human beings and forms of life on this planet have an interest in avoiding nuclear war. Absolutely uh, right. So, I mean, there couldn't be a more important common interest that we all share as human beings. And another thing is, if there's a state of belligerence between our countries, this is going to inevitably provoke an arms race, and we're going to see more and more money going into uh, in both countries. And we're seeing this happen in both countries. The military budgets are increasing rapidly, and money is being diverted away from socially beneficial uses, which is bad for Russians and Americans and Canadians. Yes, yes. So we yes. need to have this mindset that we have no common interests. That's BS. And it's, it is it's BS. Hard. And, you know, just yesterday, uh, a senior member of the Senate, a, a Republican senator, uh, gave a statement to The Washington Post saying that he's going to propose in the next federal budget that um, that the Pentagon receive five percent of GDP as its budget. Now, we're currently at three point two percent and we're bankrupting ourselves. But now they want to spend 5% of GDP. The Pentagon couldn't even spend that kind of money. But this is, this is exactly to your point. We're very much in an arms race. And not only are we in an arms race, we're the ones promoting the arms race. There, there's also another presumption, John, which I'd li like your thoughts upon, which, which I think is underlying this whole hysteria. I call it the foreign interference scam. And I'll, sometimes I refer to it as the foreign interference hysteria. And th that presumption is that the Russian government never tells the truth. So if 
you are aligned with the Russian government on some issue. So, for example, that there was a coup in Ukraine in 2014. Right. You know, we have a recording, <laughs> Victoria Newland telling the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, who the next prime minister of Ukraine is going to be, and he became the next prime minister. But hey, it's a lie. That's what we've been told. Right. But in fact, you know, sometimes the Russian government tells the truth. Does it sometimes lie? Sure, as do all governments. Of there course. is no government that is pure as the driven snow. But it's just nonsense that we we are necessarily repeating propaganda if our position aligns with the Russian government on some particular issue. So wouldn't it be smarter if we actually invited our citizens to engage in debate and try to discern the difference between truth and falsehood when it's when issues when when we hear positions from the Russian government from our own government rather than tell us that we can never align with the Russian government on any issue? I mean, oh, I, I, I think, had to get that off my chest, you know. John. Yeah, I think you I think you raise a very important point here. You know, I I, I kind of humble brag sometimes that I don't just watch one news network. I watch literally all of them. So I'll flip from CNN to MSNBC to Fox to Al Jazeera to BBC to RT. And sometimes I'll even go to the crazy ones like One America Network and Newsmax just to see what everybody's saying, but more importantly, to see what everybody's focusing on, right? Because it, it's like living on two different planets sometimes to, to watch them side by side. I can't do that now. Um, RT's gone. And BBC just parrots what's in the U.S. press. And uh, the local cable subscriber has dropped Al Jazeera. So now I'm able to watch only what the American government tells me I can watch. It's what they want me to watch. I get only their message. It's very difficult to get, uh, to get outside opinions. But you're absolutely right. Listen, every government lies. But a lot of the time, I would venture to say most of the time, what we're seeing on these other networks is the truth. That's and we should right. be the ones to decide that. 100%. After all, if we can trust people to vote, right. uh, how can we not entrust them to discern truth from falsehood when they... Uh, oh, you're, you're so them? right. Yes. So the last thing I want to ask you about, John, is this, uh, the why, the why of all of this. Why are they investing so much time and energy uh, when there's so many pressing problems in our domestic context oh. in getting people all worked up about Russian interference? And now, of course, they're talking about Chinese interference. And once in a while, they lob a grenade at Iran. They say Iran's interfering. This has become uh, quite possibly one of the most important themes in the corporate media today and in government. Yes political discourse. What, what is the motivation for all you of know, this? You know, Dimitri, I think that we're in the midst of what, what historians will come to call a watershed. When I was in college, we spent a great deal of time learning about what they called the watershed election of 1932, where the Democratic Party and the Republican Party switched sides on the issues. The Democrats had always been the conservatives. The Republicans had always been the liberals, right? If you were Republican, you were anti-slavery, going back to the 1860s. You were pro-labor, for example. Um, it was the Democrats that were the, the conservatives, especially social conservatives, and that all changed with the election in 1932 of Franklin Roosevelt as president. Okay, I think we're in the midst of seeing it flip back again. When I was at the CIA, we used to complain vociferously during the George W. Bush administration that we had never seen an administration, especially a State Department, that worked so hard to not talk to people. Well, that's what we're seeing now. Like, why are we not engaged in talks with the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and Hamas and Hezbollah and a whole host of other countries, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, I mean, the Eritreans, we can go on and on and on about countries that, oh, as policy, we, we can't talk to them. Why not? Why can't we talk to them? I, I, I made the arbitrary decision to go to Cuba last year for the very first time. The Cuban, uh, the Cuban government had translated my first two books into Spanish and included them in the permanent collection of the Cuban National Library. This was a good opportunity. I went. First of all, they treated me like a king. Secondly, to a man, 
they expressed admiration for the United States. They don't like our government so much, but it was more that people were puzzled as to why our government hates them so much. Everybody wants to work with us. The only person who expressed real frustration, I had a meeting with, with one of the vice presidents. There are three vice presidents of Cuba. So we had a meeting with one. And you know, a, a couple of people in my group, um, a couple of people in my group said, well, you know, now that Biden's in, uh, maybe he'll open things up again. So this was supposed to be the crown jewel in the Obama foreign policy. And the Cuban vice president said, no, all your presidents are the same. They blame us for everything. He goes, we, we can't even keep the lights on every day. Our children don't have shoes. We don't have medical supplies and medical equipment. And we're somehow a threat to the United States. You have relations with countries that you have far, far bigger problems with than with us. Half of our population lives in Miami. And he was right. You know, you, you've, you've caused me to want to ask you one more question <laughs> because this, this notion, which is so vitally important about dialogue between governments, um, you know, uh, peace uh, requires us to see the world through the eyes of our enemies. Uh, yes. Otherwise, we, if we never have any kind of strategic empathy, at the end of the day, we're probably doomed. So in that vein, I went to uh, Russia for the first time in um, in my life in uh, May of last year. And uh, part of my trip was to Crimea. And I went there in order to uh, try to establish a dialogue with Russians because wow. everybody in our country seemed to be you know, hostile to the idea of speaking to Russians. And uh, I called up the Russian ambassador in Canada beforehand. I heard that he for mutual acquaintance that he was familiar with my critique of Canadian foreign policy. I asked him to set me up Great. people. I went there while I'm there, while I was in Crimea, I was in Moscow. I went to Crimea. I get a call from this guy named Adam Zivo, who's a columnist at a national newspaper in Canada. And he's stationed in Ukraine at the time on the, the part that's controlled by Kiev. And he's writing these intensely uh, hostile articles about Russia and so forth and very pro NATO. And he wants to interview me. Um, that was uh, in 2023, in the middle of 2023. He just came out in August of this year, John. And he said that at the time he interviewed me, uh, and from the late 2022, he was working for the Canadian Security Intelligence Services and the Ukrainian Intelligence Services. Well, of course he was. And of course, he didn't tell me this. And, and if he had, I wouldn't have done the interview. Uh, and he never disclosed this in any of his pieces about the Ukraine war. So the question I have for you, because you come from the intelligence community, it occur one thing I, I should add is that the newspaper that he works for hasn't denied what he said. Uh, he himself uh, has clarified that he told his bosses, the editors, he was doing this work for these two intelligence agencies, and the Canadian government hasn't denied it. There hasn't been a peep. So I recall that there was a big investigative report, and I think it might have been by Bob Woodward, uh, way back in the 80s or something, where he talked about plants from the intelligence community and the media. So now that I have you here and you used to work for the CIA, I'm curious what, you, what are your thoughts about this today in the world in yeah. which you operate? Do you think that this is the Zevos of this world, the Adam Zevos of this world are fairly, they're more no, numerous than we might uh, want to want to believe in terms of- Oh yeah. 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 And, and you know what? It's even worse than most people think because the CIA, I, I can only speak uh, to the CIA, but the CIA no longer needs to recruit uh, journalists, right? They've co-opted all the journalists. Uh, I have a friend who's a journalist for Bloomberg, uh, Jason Leopold. Jason's an awesome investigative reporter. He He's a master of the Freedom of Information Act to the point where a Pentagon spokesman once called him a FOIA terrorist because he was able to uncover so much information. He's the one who who broke the Hillary Clinton um, email server story. Mm -hmm. And he did that through the Freedom of Information Act. So he told me once that he was just kind of bored one night. He was in between stories, didn't really have anything pending. So he just kind of dashed off a quick Freedom of Information Act request to the CIA, to the Office of Public Affairs, asking for all emails between the Office of Public Affairs and American journalists from one date to another date. He said he didn't have anything in mind, just was kind of curious. 
to see what was in there. They answered the request. And what he found was, for example, Ken Delanian, who is the chief national security correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC here in the United States, formerly the, the chief intelligence correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, writes his articles and sends them to the CIA for clearance before sending them to his own editor. Oh my God. Can you imagine? This is a guy making, you know, a million bucks a year. He's supposed to be the go-to intelligence guy. And he's essentially just saying to the CIA, well, what do you want me to say? What do you want me not to say? Here's what I'm proposing. What do you think about it? Another thing that he found was a journalist who wrote something critical of the CIA, who sent it into the Office of Public Affairs for a comment saying, hey, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to criticize you. Do you have a comment? And they said, so help us. If you publish this, you are not invited to the Christmas party and we will never give you a quote again. <laughs> this was in the email. Oh, God. It was in the email. <laughs> and, he, and he dropped the article. You know, the so you don't, the access you don't need to investigate. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, so uh, I, basically, we should assume that um, um, that this problem is more widespread than one columnist at the National Post. I think that's fair to say. Yes. <laughs> in, in any case, it, it's it's everywhere. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, John. Uh, Thank I, you, Dimitri. I hope that we can continue the conversation in the future. I'm sure we're going to hear about more about foreign interference. Oh, I look I'll forward to it. Talk to you about you know other foreign policy issues of great importance to us. The the pleasure is mine. I look forward to staying in touch. Okay, and this is Dimitri Lascaris signing off from Kalamata, Greece, on September 28, 2024.